having me, man. Yeah, glad to be here, Brian. It, uh, you know, I, uh, I when I when I saw you know the mission of your podcast and and the you know this 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 principle like just get started, I, I was super fired up because I'm I'm as interested sort of to hear where where what what that means to you and kind of how this got started. Frankly, because um, I think the mission is 100% worthwhile, and and uh, I couldn't be a bigger believer in what it is that you're uh, you're sharing with people. Yeah, well, I appreciate the kind words. I. You know, it's one of those things where I think getting started, and, and this is why I'm curious to go with your story, getting started is hard for a lot of people. I mean, because I, you know, I, I kind of break it down to, we can all say we want to change, but, you know, we have to, we're like, hey, I want to change. I want to do something better, whether it's, you know, getting in shape or whatever, starting a business, et cetera. But then we hash it. This, this is one of the reasons I want to have you the podcast is we have to create certain habits and systems and have discipline as well as a, a variety of other things to actually get started and keep pressing forward. Otherwise we'll kind of fall back into the old ways. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, one of the things is I actually saw that with myself and that's ultimately why like the podcast, as well as some of the other things with writing and, and what have you and coaching I do is because I, f- I saw it with myself and I said, well, if I could be kind of a, a beacon of hope for people yeah. that, Hey, here's some guy that, maybe should have no business doing this stuff because he was just, you know, kind of just your average guy. Sure. Maybe I could do it too. So that's kind of the, you know, the, the, the Genesis in a, in a short, um, I guess in the nut, um, you know, cracking it open just a little, yeah. but that, and that's what intrigued me with your story because, and it seemed like, you know, cause you had, you know, at least from what I researched and tell me if I'm wrong here, where obviously you're big into, you know, very competitive, very big into, I think it was football and, mm-hmm. and very, um, you know, competition driven there. And then, Hey, you go out and, you know, you work for an organization for a while. I'm curious when you transition the mindset, especially with discipline, I'm assuming that was always a part of your life, but when did you realize that, wait a minute, this is something I can help individuals out with organizations, you know, leaders. When did you realize that there's a change here that could be helpful for the, for the better? You know, it, it's, it's funny um, because discipline was absolutely not part of, uh, part of my life competitive. Yes. Discipline. No, not, not by any measure, um, that anybody would, would from the outside in look at me and say, Oh boy, there's a, there's a disciplined person, right? Not as a kid. In fact, not, you know, not as a kid, not as a teenager, not as a a college student. I competed really hard in athletics, but it wouldn't be what people call discipline. Right. Um, and certainly not in the traditional view of discipline. We can talk about sort of how the how the the traditional or I should say that the the version of discipline you and I were probably taught growing up is broken and that we, we need to return to the intent of discipline the truth of discipline but you know when I got older as an adult have you ever taken strengths finders the, the strengths finders with you know, the book where you, you take it and you get like your five strengths and your supporting five I've never I've never fully went through that so if okay. you can share a little bit so just what I mean it, it, it's only oh I only say because I think there's 35 or 36 strengths in this book and it, it identifies your your top five and then they they did an advancement in it where they actually ranked according to the answers that they 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 gave me you know, what the rank order of all strengths from my highest to my least. Mm-hmm. And um, as of just a few years ago, I, I redid it just sort of to, to catch back up again. And discipline was second to last out of 36. It was 35 mm-hmm. out of 36. And so for me, um, and this is, I've been pretty self-aware of this for a while and why I got started with daily discipline specifically. And frankly, just kind of everything that I do is it's a learned skill. It's not natural. It's not innate. It doesn't come easily or or uh, or seamlessly or smoothly for me. It is work. It is. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to say it's against my nature, Brian. Right? Because because discipline, I don't think, is against anyone's nature. I think uh, uh, it's learning how to use discipline to lean into right what might be natural for you and learn how to. Get, take what's unnatural for you and make sure that doesn't cost you. There's a bunch of strategies and stuff like that, but, but one is no, it wasn't. So I practically, right. I was a really good competitor, really good teammate, um, really good on fields. Um, But I was physically, I wasn't, I wasn't massively talented. I played college football, um, had a really fun career, um, started for four years, you know, but I played it five, nine, 160, 170 pounds. So I wasn't physically somebody that 
was walking onto a field dominating and you can just, you know, do the math going backwards, right? I was the smallest person on every court right. and every field and every everything. And so my way of competing wasn't talent-based. It was choice-based. It was the decision to go harder. It was the decision to pay more attention. It was the decision to, uh, um, you know, to, to lock in, to, to, to compete more intensely, to pay attention and, and, and observe and try to put patterns together so I could get ahead of the curve a little bit. And I, I never, I never converted that into the athletic or into the academic side, um, even all the way through college. It not, was not a good student, a, a typical entrepreneur story. I just didn't care about grades. Um, and where I made the transition was after college. Uh, after college, I wanted to teach leadership and discipline and team culture to coaches mostly because I saw this big gap of coaches talking about stuff, but not actually implementing good systems for doing it. Um, you know, I would see them, you know, yell about mental toughness and focus, but then not teach anything and definitely not teach anything as systematically or as thoroughly, uh, or work as hard on it as we did on a practice field or in a weight room, right? We were, we were infinitely more invested in how we worked in the weight room than how we worked on our own personal discipline, our own trust, et cetera. And when you're working harder on your squats than you are on, right. What's going on in your head, what's going on in your heart, what's going right. on in your relationships, you end up with a team that's physically strong, but weak in all the areas that matter. Yeah. So I'm like, well, why don't I, I can train that? And so I went out and I tried to launch a business coaching coaches um, and I completely failed. Uh, I couldn't get anybody to listen, couldn't get anybody to even meet with me barely. Um, oh. And I mean it when I say like I, in my one year of trying to get that off the ground after college, I got, I didn't get a single second meeting. Uh, I didn't make a single dollar. <laughs> I mean, not one coach hired me whatsoever. And then I, I pivoted into business and I learned really quickly um, about how competitive business was and all of the things that I loved about sports, it existed in business. And where it was different was in sports, it was all this, all this practice time and training and preparation time that didn't count on the scoreboard. Uh, and again, I'll just speak from football, but you, know, you can do this for any sport, but in football, you only play a game once a week. Right, but you have hours and hours and hours and hours of training and you're doing all this work, but it doesn't really count against anything. So you could, you could be at your absolute best on a Thursday or a Tuesday, a Wednesday. Uh, but if you weren't at your best on Saturdays, right, between 12 and 3.30, right, or whatever, from 8 to 11.30, it didn't matter how good you were on Wednesday. Like you needed to be good on Saturdays. And so it was, it was this massive prep time for this very, very small scoreboard time. In business, I got excited when I realized it was the complete inverse. Every day was scoreboard day. Every day was game day. And you walked in and every day it was let's go. And then the downside of that was that they didn't allot very much time for training. And so you end up with people who continued bad habits or, you know, got to, you know, 50 years old and had risen up the ranks and they were still a very average listener at best. And it was costing them, you know, it was costing them maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars because they couldn't listen to what a client was saying and then connect what they said and what they really needed to the service inside the business. And they were leaving, you know, for some clients to work with, literally leaving millions of dollars on the table because they didn't have listening skills and then trust to go bring in somebody from a different service line and serve that client in that way. And then helping them see that, that you didn't need new strategy or process necessarily. But if you could get the, the behavior skill that unlocked the job or technical skills, like that yeah, could yeah. improve the experience, obviously improve the revenue, improve the performance, the market, you know, all, all the different stuff in business. And I was like hooked. I was immediately like, I'm, I'm all in. So it took me, it took me probably two to three years post-college, one full year of trying to get the business off the ground and failing. And then I'd say another year to kind of get the transition fully out of the, the sports perspective for me. Yeah. And into falling in love with the competitive side of business. Yeah. Well, you make a good point because, and this is something I've observed being in corporate America for a lot of years in, in sales and in enterprise sales and what have you, is, is the training aspect. That's where I see a massive gap. But I think it's in all areas of business. But, you know, you liken it to sports and the fact of, you know, pick any athlete, right? LeBron, right, has, you know, I mean, look at the, I'm a big golfer. So look at the PJ championship coming up this mm -hmm. week as we're recording this, like 
they're going to have their swing instructors out there. They're going to have their their uh, you know, massage therapists. They're going to have their 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 physical trainers, whatever it is. And but yet we don't have that. It's like, hey, go to work, do this particular task or many of these tasks, and then show up the next day and do the same thing. And there's no guidance and coaching to actually improve. And we wonder why people don't get better or why they have the same habits for many, many years. So to what to your point, it's like having having outsiders come in isn't bad if we're going to give them the tools to not only learn in the moment, but then take those tools and advance down the road. That's why I think sales training is, we don't have to go down the rabbit hole of that, but I think is so bad because it's like, hey, come in and do a one or two day presentation and get everyone row, row, you know, and, and rowdy and, and excited. And then what? Doesn't improve anything. Yeah, you know right. I mean? And, and you know, and there's, there's a... <clears throat> whether it's sales training or, you know, I, I use the example of listening because for whatever reason, listening is this thing that, um, you know, you ask a room of a hundred people, you know, who here knows they're just not that great of a listener. And like, you'll have half the hands in the room go up mm -hmm. and then, you know, and I'll ask, well, who here has known that for what you would call, like you have, you've known that about yourself for some time now, right? Like years, all these hands go up. I'm like, how many of you are not meaningfully better at listening than you were a decade ago. And most hands still stay up. And I'm like, well, look, we've gotten to this spot with training and you know, sales is a great example. Listening is a great example. Leadership is a great example where we have this abundance of content and information. And we've heard so many things before that we've confused having heard something with both understanding it and being able to do it well. And I, I'm not interested in whether somebody's heard something before. I'm only interested in how well they can do it. And if they're not that good at it, right? You don't, you don't, you're not justified in saying, oh, I've heard that before. And this is the issue with training is people go through a training and they'll hear something that maybe they heard seven or eight years ago, but they haven't gotten started or continue doing it. And they tune off the message and tune it out because they've heard it before and they don't want to hear it again. And if somebody brings them face to face with, hey, you're tuning out, but your behavior patterns are showing that you are a far cry from what's being trained here, there's defensiveness will kick in or blame or whatever. So anyway, it, and it's good people, right? It's good people who do this, uh, but it's a big issue. It's a big issue in, in business right now um, on the training front um, because we've got more content than we have execution around content. Well, I think this just comes down to human nature in general. You know, we, we see this in our very politicized world. It's like we have these beliefs that maybe we grew up with. And, and this is, I want to go back to, to define discipline in a second, because I know that, as you mentioned, was kind of something from our upbringing. But if you think about it, like we have these beliefs. And then if anyone pushes up on our beliefs, instead of being open and be like, okay, that's interesting, or I'm curious to learn more, or yeah, let me hear you out. We, we get defensive, the walls go up, you know, we get in these echo chambers and it's the same thing happens with work in, in whatever field you're in, instead of being yeah, open and direct. Right. I, I, the, way, the way I think about that in my own life, and obviously I think about this in my own life um, all of the time. And so it's of course the standard that I do apply to other people. I don't, I don't expect people to share my standard, but it's the standard I apply sort of when I'm observing somebody like around say something like that, like beliefs is, uh, the standard I apply to myself is this, like, do I think I am right about everything is the first question I ask myself. Do I think I'm right about everything? The answer is no. The answer, is, the answer for me is not just no. The answer is a resounding, of course not, right? Because if I knew all the right answers, I would do them. If I knew all the right answers, I would not let anyone else take charge I would be the one to go solve the problems. I would, if I knew all the right answers, right? I would never make a mistake with my wife. I'd never make a mistake with my kids. I would, I would immediately get into some, I would, I would, I would run a business. I would run the city of Charlotte where I'm living now or Denver. I would find the track to the president because I'm right about everything. I know what to do, right? Everybody else, you don't know what to do. Brian Kite knows what to do. No way. Now, I don't let that damage my confidence though. Because if I knew where I was right and where I was wrong definitively across the board, then everything gets a little more clear in terms of me being able to be decisive. But all right, cut this out, put that in place, et cetera. So I know that I'm not right about everything, but the hard part is not knowing where I'm off base and where I'm not. The only way for me to figure that out is by going into the world, 
living out my values, my beliefs, my standards, and then getting feedback from real actual experiences. And when I get feedback that bumps up against, hey, I'm going to go live this out. I think this is a good strategy. This is a good way to do this. This is a good way to parent. Or I think this is the thing I need to say to my wife right now in this moment. And then I will get feedback. And if we're not open to that feedback, if we're not receptive to that, like say in this politicized environment where everybody has these beliefs, well, I know you bump up against something and and you, you see this all the time, not just politically, right? But you see this with everything. We get and we know this about human nature now in particular, cognitive dissonance being the term. You have a belief, you have a, a, a way you think the world works, you live it, the world gives you feedback that that doesn't work or your perspective is off base. Yeah. And then rather than change our belief according to the experience and the reality, we will literally try to minimize or change reality right. yeah. to fit our belief system. Right, that's exactly And right. I, I, I just fundamentally don't believe in that. And, I, and, and for me, what that's rooted in, it's a, it's a term that I, I, I started coining a while ago, or, or I, I say coined, whatever, I just started using it and people kind of latched onto it called aggressive humility. I, I believe in aggressive humility. I'm not a fan of passive humility. You know, the, the people who say, now I'm not saying I'm perfect, but you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of that. One, because nobody accused me of that. And nobody accused you. Anybody who says, I'm not saying I'm perfect. You literally weren't told that. So <laughs> no right. one suggested it. You're yeah. admitting nothing. Okay? Right. And then and then what's happening is I, now people say, look, I'm not saying I'm perfect. And then when presented with their imperfections and the consequences of it, they get upset, defensive, and offended. Yeah. Right. And so for me, aggressive humility is this. I don't want my humility to damage my, 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 my self-esteem. And I don't want my humility to damage my confidence. And I don't want my, da- my humility to damage my ability to go into the world and try to make things happen, good things happen. Mm-hmm. And so what you see is a lot of people have humility or in the name of humility, they will tiptoe and walk on eggshells and be afraid of coming across as arrogant or whatever it happens to be. And my perspective is just, it's just a little different. It's, I already know that I don't know everything. I already know that I'm not right about everything, but because I don't know where that all is, I've got to go out in the world and test what I believe. And that means I have to go out and do it as best as I believe, as best as I can. So if I think X, I got to go live X confidently Mm -hmm. and somewhat assertively, right? To see, does X actually hold up under pressure in the real world? And if it does, awesome. But if not, well, then guess what? My belief in X was not on a great foundation and I'm going to figure out through experience where I need to change it. And that aggressive version of humility keeps me in this really healthy space, I believe, of of trying out and testing what I believe, but also I'm making sure that I'm on, my beliefs are on trial, right? Like my beliefs have to actually stand up to scrutiny and pressure when it's hard. And so being aggressive about that in my mind is, is a great way to live out humility and not kind of passively wade through life, so to speak. Well, and, and you made a great point. And one of the words you use in there a few times I'll, I want to underscore is perspective. It's something I use a lot. I try to teach this to my son because, you know, it's like we always look at things through one lens. But I'm like, if you could step aside, I read this great book called Awareness by Anthony DeMello that was really impactful mm-hmm. for me. I'm not sure if you ever read that one, um, but I recommend for folks out there listening. Again, it almost like steps you outside your body. And it's kind of like thinking again, how do you observe yourself? Like, how, like, like Brian, how are you observing me now? How, what, what's the perspective you have? I might have my own thoughts. And again, from all these things I've learned in my life or, or whatever, um, but how does other people view me and being open to that feedback is important. Do we always take it? Well, no. Well, where's it coming from? You know, I think we have to have that perspective on mm-hmm. people are have different opinions, but to your point, one of the big things too, is around questions. Like you mentioned, yeah, if you believe something, go hard at it couldn't agree more. But then at some point you have to stop and ask questions, right? And say, is this right? Is this the best thing? You know, can I do it differently? Can I look at it? Is this person actually making a fair point? I might not agree with it, but does it sure. make me think different? Sure. And I think just having that opportunity um, to open our minds to that, it just allows us to learn things different. Whether it's very small incremental, it doesn't yeah, have to be and, you know, and, and go right up the alley of, of the entire tent be, uh, intent with what it is that you're doing here. I, I, aggressive humility for me is also recognizing that my path to success, happiness, fulfillment, meaning, you know, right, that, that spectrum, my path is not the right path. 
and it, it is definitely not the only one. There are literally thousands of alternatives to the way that I am approaching how to bring those things into my life mm -hmm. that are viable and real and worthwhile. Thousands. It, it, there might, there's probably not thousands for me, for Brian Kite. There's probably not thousands right, for you, uh, but there's dozens. Right? There's dozens of ways that I can pursue happiness and fulfillment and success and meaning and purpose in my life as it is for you. Aggressive humility means that just because somebody is doing it differently than I do, just because, right, I believe in, you know, X political principles and somebody believes in Y on the opposite end, it doesn't mean that they're wrong. And it doesn't mean that I am right. It's not a, most of these things are not zero sum games where it's, you know, it, where it's, you know, win or loser. It's like, there's elements of truth in all of it. And there's also, right, there's elements of cost, Right. I mean, I think one of the one of the really one of the really cool pieces, one of the pull too many threads here, but you know, the other piece that it goes with aggressive humility and beliefs, since we're on the topic, is um, really two, I, I put two things together. One, there are no directionless decisions. And number two is there are no painless paths. Number one, no directionless decisions. Every decision that I make about what to believe, what standard to live. It is pointing me in a direction and a trajectory every time, everything I do, right? Every decision I make with my kid. Now, whether I let my kid eat a popsicle at noon today, is that is that going to change and alter the trajectory significantly? No, but it's not directionless, right? As you know, with, the, with, with kids, right? You make one decision, your kids are going to be like, all right, let's try to get that decision again, right? And so it, it puts a direction. And so if I say, hey, we're going to have a popsicle at 10 a.m. today, right? for probably the next two weeks in the mornings, my kids are going to be like, another popsicle? Like they're going to be like, hey, is that standard going to be right. repeating here? Um, and so I think about my own beliefs is every belief that I hold, every time I like, every time if you try to give me feedback that I resist it and I make it hard for you to tell me the truth because I make it a pain in the ass for us to talk about it, mm -hmm. that has a consequence in the direction of our relationship, right? So this decision matters to our trajectory. So that's number one. So I take that seriously with my beliefs. And then number two, no painless paths is a lot of people's beliefs or, or, or the way they manage those things is trying to minimize their discomfort. Um, and it's a huge problem um, because we don't, you can't escape discomfort. All you can do is transfer it. It's a huge principle for people, especially with the just getting started principle and that theme that something I would love for people to latch onto. So there's stuff flying here. Um, something I would love for people to latch onto is <clears throat> there is no alleviating discomfort in the big sense. There's only transferring it. So if you don't want to get started because it's uncomfortable, just understand you aren't escaping discomfort. You're just transferring it to a different part of your life. You're still going to be uncomfortable. The path is still going to be painful. But now maybe, you know, maybe you don't want to get started working out because it's uncomfortable for you or you're, you're insecure about your body or whatever it happens to be, or you don't want to change jobs because it'd be uncomfortable to move cities because of this reason there, whatever happens. If you avoid that discomfort, all you're really doing is taking, well, I don't want to be uncomfortable working out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be uncomfortable in my own body for the next three years. I'm going to be uncomfortable at where I've allowed myself to slip to gradually. I'm going to be uncomfortable, you know, after dinner when I eat, or I'm going to be uncomfortable at the beach or again, whatever it happens, you're not alleviating it. You're just putting it somewhere else in your life. So every path is painful, every single one of them. The question is, what would be a belief system that I'm willing to experience some pain to live out? Mm -hmm. What belief system is worth the cost that it has? People say a bad, a good attitude costs you nothing. But yes, it does. You have a good attitude. There are going to be people who criticize you for it. You're going to be called naive. You're going to be, you know, you're going to have a good attitude and someone's going to tell you, shut up, quit being so positive. What? It's going to cost you. You're going to be an outlier more often than you're going to be on the in crowd. You're going to feel a little left out if you have a real, true, honest, positive attitude. It's going to happen. And that pain is so real for people that in corporate America, in schools, in businesses, in their social groups, they will commiserate, not because they genuinely believe it, but because they don't wanna be the outsider who stays positive while everybody else is complaining about stuff. And they will drop their positive attitude to commiserate 
just so they can feel a sense of belonging and not feel the pain of being on the outside of everybody else. Mm. So my, my, my piece for, for, for me that, again, I, I share this not as a directive to anyone else, but just you know, uh, uh, an awareness that I have and, a, and an observation that I've noticed is I don't get to choose whether or not I experience pain in my life. All I get to, ex- all I get to choose is what I experience pain for. Mm. I do get to choose why I'm in pain. And if I'm going to be in pain, it's going to be pain of parenting my kids to really good standards, not pain of why are my kids so poorly behaved when I've tried to do everything for them. Like I get to choose which pain to experience. I'm going to choose the pain of high standards, good structure with love. And then the pain of my kids stepping outside those boundaries and learning what happens. I'm not going to experience the pain of not putting boundaries so that I don't experience something uncomfortable with my kid. And then later on experience the pain of my kid learning lessons at 25 that frankly, I could have taught him at 12. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. That's a, I, I really like how you put that. And the analogy, you know, I always like to go to working out. I think it's just the simplest analogy for most folks. It's like, yeah, there might be discomfort into showing up at the gym every day or going out for a walk or run. Of course. But yeah. The discomfort of maybe feeling, you know, if you're unhealthy, maybe feeling bad or not getting enough sleep or being sluggish, like those are discomforts that happen over time because of that. So it's kind of, yeah, you make that choice to, to or decide. Or not being able to get off the couch when I'm 60, right? Yeah. Like being like, oh, I, I have to move slow or man, I can't, I can't take my grandkids you know, to the zoo, because it's just kind of harder for me to walk because my, you know, my hips aren't that strong. Like, you know, I turned 40 last week. Um, and so it's like, you know, I, I'm looking at it like, it's not, I'm not out here to perform something per se, right? Maybe yeah. on the golf course, right? But, but I'm not trying to set records or PRs. I'm looking just saying, you know, I would much rather go through a minor discomfort with purpose today than have to deal with the discomfort of being weak later in my life. And then having to recover from it. Yeah. I'll just, I'll go through the pain of staying in shape, not the pain of getting back in shape. Right. No, that's a great point. Well, and that's actually, you know, maybe circles back around to discipline. Yeah. Um, all, all, all roads lead back to that because one of the things I was thought about leaving or coming into this conversation was just around the delayed gratification. Mm-hmm. Generally, like what you just mentioned there, a lot of those things, even with, even with kids, as we know, yeah, you might have to make what are tough decisions. They don't like it. They push back on you, but you know, in the long run, that's going to be better, or at least you would think it'd be better based on all the knowledge you have, but that's delayed gratification. And a lot of times, if we make the mistake of the short-term gain, that all ultimately leads us down the wrong path. So if we can chat about discipline for a minute, can you, let's go back all the way to the beginning of our conversation and define, if you define discipline and maybe because I'm 39. So I'm similar kind of older millennial like you. Um, how did we learn discipline growing up? What's the, what yeah. was that definition? And how is it should be different or thought about differently? Well, let's, I mean, let's do this. I mean, did you play sports growing up? I played some. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. What sports did you play? Played basketball. I was a big golfer. Okay. Um, yeah. cool. So I mean, did you grow up in Carolina? No, I grew up in New York, upstate New okay. York. Okay. So, so when you think about sports, school, parents, authority yeah. figures, right? Whatever authority figure you experienced in your upbringing, you got some combination of, you know, sports. I'm not sure what else you were involved in, but you got some kind of sports, some kind of school, right? Some kind of parents than any others. Um, and at 39 years old, like what, it, what was the understanding of discipline that you gained by the people who taught you discipline, whoever they were, what was the <laughs> understanding that you had? The understanding was, you know, keep your ass in line or, <laughs> or, you know, you're going to whatever, get in trouble, do your homework, do, you know, you know, whatever, don't, don't pop off at practice or don't whatever, or again, right. and generally I think that, you know, I think not only my parents' generation, but my grandparents' generation was that hard nose, you know, you're, you're, you know, you, you not only have to grind, but like stay in line. Don't, don't ever pop off. Don't ever do anything. Yeah. That, I would say yeah. that's kind of, and my- then, and then when they would, and then when they would particularly say in athletics, <clears throat> When, when, when somebody in athletics or sports wanted to teach discipline, what kinds of things did they do to teach personal discipline? Not the punishment version of discipline, yeah. but which, you know, you get disciplined by your parents or you get disciplined by school or whatever it is. But when, a, when somebody in sports or athletics wanted to teach discipline, what kinds of things would they do? Usually it was physically related, but what kinds of things would they do, right? It was, it was touch the line when you run, right? It yeah. was get behind the line. It was, it was the attention to the detail. Mm-hmm. And so what happened, Brian, was this, and we're, this is still prevalent. This is still the most common piece, 
But basically what happened was we were taught discipline when what they really meant was obedience. Mm. We were taught discipline when what they really meant was compliance. And so being obedient is following authority. Being compliant is following the rule, right? So if authority said, do this, stay in line with whatever I say, it didn't even matter, right, for us growing up, right? Because, you know, we're, we're, right, we're the older millennial or younger Gen X, or we're, you and I are sort of on this threshold, right? But in my, in my environment where I grew up, and I grew up in California, it, it didn't matter what the standard or the principle was. If the authority said it, that was what you did, and they taught discipline according to what they said. Um, it didn't even matter what was right and wrong, and there wasn't even a lot of oversight in those environments. So discipline was do what the authority says and stay in line, right? Do what the rule says and stay in line. Don't ask about the rule. Don't question the rule. Right. In sports, it was it was statements like players play, coaches coach. Shut up and do your do what I'm telling you. Like that was the even verbatim sometimes. And so here's what happened: we raised a bunch of people who one believed discipline was following someone else's instruction or some other rule out in the world. Number two was we raised people who had no real way or understanding of how to make the choice for themselves. Mm -hmm. And when given the opportunity, what do people who have been confined to structure and obedience and process and, and, and compliance their whole life, what choice do they make? They make the choice to get the hell outside of it. So we've had this misunderstanding of discipline now for a while in that we confuse discipline with punishment, obedience, and compliance. And, and I'll ask this from a dad perspective, because I think this is a great place to start. Um, there are times where my kids need to experience consequences and I'm the one who has to deliver them, right? There's a, there's a you know, whatever you want to call it, punishment aspect of that. There's times where my authority as a dad is one that we that my kid needs to be obedient to. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. So there are times where I need obedience, okay? And then there's other times where there is some compliance. Hey, we've got some principles. We've got some rules, right? My wife is real hardcore, right? No shoes in the house, right? My, my kids walk in and if somebody else has their shoes on in my house, my kids will tell that person about it real quick, especially my two-year-old. She, she's, a, she's a stickler for that one. However, however, as a dad, and your oldest is almost 10, yeah, he'll be 10 yeah. very soon. Okay. As a dad with your 10-year-old, is there going to come a time where his obedience to you reaches an end? Where he no longer lives out of obedience to you as his dad? I'm wondering if that's already started to happen. I mean, I mean, I don't mean I don't mean where he I don't mean where he pushes back against it. I mean, is there a time where it ends, where he where his life is no longer one where he lives out of obedience to your authority? Oh, sure. I mean, I'm, I, I would assume, yeah, as he gets in his adolescence and, and leaves the leaves the nest, if you will. At some point, right? Yeah. At some point, for some people, it's 15. For some people, it's 18. For others, it's 20, whatever it happens to be. But here's the thing. Our kids, at some point, are no longer going to live out of compliance to our rules and obedience to our rules, our yeah. authority. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, what we need them to have is the discipline to choose for themselves. Yeah. And that's what discipline is. Discipline is not compliance and following rules. That's compliance. If you want someone to follow rules, mm -hmm. call it compliance. I want you to comply with the rule. Now, I want you to be disciplined about complying with the rule, no doubt. Okay. If you want them to be obedient, let's use obedience. And right? especially like what's, what's, I ask this in parenting, but then when I talk about this in the professional setting, in sports or in business. And you say, look, if you want obedience, you got to ask for it. Leaders are getting real uncomfortable, right? Like saying, I want you to be obedient to what I, they're like, I don't like saying that. So what they use is they use the word discipline when what they really want is obedience, but they're not willing to look another grown adult in the eye and tell them to be obedient to me. Yeah. And so what they do is they dress it up in these words. Discipline fundamentally is being able to choose for yourself. That's what discipline is. Discipline is the freedom of choice. Discipline can't be supplied from the outside in. Discipline has to be chosen from the inside out. Discipline comes from within, not from outside. So when my kid is on his own at right now at five, I need him to have good discipline for a five-year-old. I need him to know 
What is good choices? What are good standards? How do we treat people? And what I'm trying to build and cultivate in him is not doing it because dad said so, not doing it because there was some rule exists, but doing it because he is consciously making the choice based on who he wants to be, how he wants to treat people and what he wants to happen. Hmm. Choosing that is the most important because when you get into the real setting, there is no rule. Like there's no right. rules for you and me. I mean, there's laws that we have to abide by but outside of that. There's no rules. Yeah. There's, there is no, there's, there is no authority that says how I have to live my life. I have complete autonomy. I can go anywhere. I can do anything. I can treat people how I want. But with that freedom to choose is also the freedom to experience all of the consequences of our choices. And we live in a very odd era right now where people want the freedom to choose but they don't want the freedom of all the consequences that come with it. They want right. freedom to choose, but then they want protection from the consequences of those choices. Right. And that violates the basic physics of the world. So what, what my big thing with discipline and helping people is, is, you know, you say the word discipline to people and they immediately think of something militaristic, tight, rigid, regimented, unbroken, right? It's right. this like Jocko and David Goggins level of like intensity. And I'm like, look, I mean, those guys are great dudes. I don't know them, but sure. But I, I, that's not my life. Like I'm not, I don't live like that and I don't want to, right? Like they are who they are. And I'm sure there's a little bit of a caricature of some kind, but that's not how most people live. Most people need good discipline for who they want to be and where they want to go. Meaning they can't be looking to an authority or a compliance or a rule or feel like they're somehow being rigid. But when we learn that discipline is being able to choose for yourself yeah. and that there's a spectrum, it's not yes or no, it's scale of discipline, right? I can, I can be, and again, just kind of you know, you think about numbers, think of one to 10, plus one to plus 10, minus one to minus 10. I can be plus one discipline, which is, you know, not doing the, not doing the, the, the more dysfunctional thing or not doing the thing, right? It's just whatever. I got out of bed early. I didn't do anything productive with my time, but I got out of bed early. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I, I, uh, I didn't eat cake. Now, I didn't eat a great healthy dinner, but I also didn't eat dessert. Is that great discipline? Probably not. Is it going to have massive product? Probably not. But what? It's not a minus, right? It's plus right. one. It's good. It's, it's fine. Like that plus one works. That's a start. It's better than minus one. It's better than minus two. And then there's plus 10, right? Which is the all out maxed out level of discipline, super intense. And we don't live at plus 10, but most people, when you, when you talk to them about discipline, they think and feel in terms of plus 10 level rigidity and consistency and unbrokenness. Yeah. And what I want to open people up to is really this two, this two pronged piece. Discipline is simply choosing for yourself according to the purpose and the standards that you want. And then like believing in that and saying, look, that will take me in a good direction. And then number two is understanding it's a spectrum, not a switch, a yes or a no. Discipline is not a possession, hmm. it's an action. And so I could act on this scale of spectrum on the plus side, or I can act on a scale of spectrum on the minus side, right? So I can, if my wife asks me a question and I just blow her off, right? That's probably a minus one, minus two. If my wife asks me a question and I snap back with a snide remark, right? That's like a minus six, minus eight. Right. Like that's like I did it to kind of like get at her and I, and I did it, you know, for the purpose of some kind of competition and make her feel what. Boom, that's a minus. And I know in that moment now, if I recognize that, have self-awareness and I come back and I say, hey, you know what? I'm like, I snapped at you today and I was super frustrated, annoyed. And like you had said this thing and it hurt my feelings yesterday. And I'm like, I just recognize that Like I literally just said that today to get back at you. And that is not who I want to be. Boom. Plus five. Right. Like. We're snapped right back up. So yeah. this is real life, right? It's not like I'm not living in discipline zone. Yeah, I'm choosing moment to moment where to be on my scale of discipline and every moment refreshes anew. And, and so it's not a spot where we arrive. I am a discipline. I'm not a disciplined person. I'm only disciplined when I'm choosing discipline myself and then acting on it. Yeah. Make sense? No. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I, I like that approach because yeah, instead of putting that, that goal out in the distance of like, I want to be more disciplined or is it kind of the same, you know, maybe, maybe the, the cousin of that is I want to be more consistent. Okay. Consistent at what? Like, and, 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 and how often, and what, yeah. you know, like, what does that mean actually? And, and putting a definition around it of what does it mean for us? Yeah. You don't have to be Goggins-esque, but at the same time, like Goggins is 
he, 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 his discipline level is different than most people's, but that's yeah. for him. It's Correct. recognizing what is for us and in each of us. Um, and I think partly too is recognizing, I think I, I probably did this subconsciously, but like recognizing I was in that old mindset that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And I was waiting for people to give me direction versus going out and in, in the, the lack of a better phrase, like taking the direction or saying, give me the you know map. I'm, I'm drawing the next route. Like I was always kind of waiting for people to do something or, Hey, let me, yeah, let me partner up on this almost because I was uncomfortable in doing it myself and forging. Mm -hmm. But once I changed that mindset and it took a while, it allowed me to, to your point was like, let me choose each time. And if I keep showing up for the person I want to be in the future, yeah. I'm going to make better decisions. And ultimately I'm going to forge a better path, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, <laughs> you, you said it right because not only do we sometimes wait for permission or instruction or whatever, but a really sneaky way this shows up for a lot of people is um, they're waiting to find the right answer in another book or read one more site or get one more plan or look for it in the strategy that they choose. It doesn't matter what strategy you choose. Like, and I, and I, I say this, you know, May, may, that may, may not be an absolute statement, but it's a pretty reliable, it, it doesn't really matter what strategy you choose. Go learn by doing. Mm -hmm. But what people do is they'll procrastinate telling themselves they're studying more, or I need to gather more info, or I need to get a better plan together. And all they're doing is slowing themselves down. And I'll give you this principle that, that I realized in the midst of this process, again, as an undisciplined person, like by nature, discipline, like you know, I was always willing to make choices, but my choices, my, my wiring is more impulsive, right? My wiring is, is, is more um, spontaneous and free flowing. It's not, I don't have a natural structured. Um, I've got clear standards, but I'm not structured in the typical way that, that you would, that most people would think of a disciplined person. And so I started to learn as I started to look at this, that discipline doesn't need to look the way that it was shown to me growing up or shown to us growing up. Discipline can look a lot of different ways. And just because discipline doesn't look like the, you know, attention to detail, you know, regimented approach of somebody else, it doesn't mean that discipline isn't there, right? I, I look at rather than define discipline, I look at what are the, what are the, what are the, the, the building blocks of discipline, building blocks of discipline, intention, purpose, standards, effort, the level of control that I have over myself um, and skill. I just look at those six things, right? Intentions, purpose, effort, the standards that I set, I mean, like really consciously chosen standards. I treat people like this, not like that. Um, I, 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 uh, I, I, I um, in our house, we do this, we don't do that, right? We interact with each other like this, not like that. I, I, I treat my body like this, not like that. Just setting standards. Not because you said them or a book said them. I set the standards for me, right? right? Um, and then, and then um, uh, the the level of control I have over myself, and then the skill that I actually build in it. And if I hit those six, I just look at those six things, and as long as I am really clear, right, or at least directionally clear on 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 a bunch of those six, I know I'm at least on the plus side, and I can mm -hmm. go. Just yep. get on the plus side. But what will happen is people will be, they'll want to be 10 out of 10 prepared and yep. they'll want to know what the next two years looks like. And if they don't feel 10 out of 10 prepared and what the next two years look like and that they've satisfied everything, what they'll do is they'll live on the minus side until they feel like they've satisfied everything on the plus side. Then their gap will be too big. They'll feel right. intimidated by the journey and then stop. Yeah. So I realized this principle and it's huge. Discipline is the shortcut. Think about this for a second. Mm -hmm. The fastest path between where you are and where you want to get is the path of discipline because every other path will take longer. Now, the shortest path, I say shortcut, right? The shortcut and the shortest path, depending on what it is that you're trying to attack, it may be two years. It may be two years of work intensely. If you're disciplined, that's the shortest possible path that could exist yeah. but you're comparing it to a lack of discipline and then being right where you are today seven years from now and seven years have gone by and, if, and i do this whenever like i'll do like a keynote or a workshop i'll have this 
Uh, I'll, I'll kind of do this moment. It's really cool for people. And, and if you're listening and you're not driving, you can do this, but I'll tell people like, close your eyes. Maybe kind of close your eyes. And like, I'm not gonna do anything weird or goofy or trust fall you, right? But close your eyes. And I want you to think about something that you told yourself you were gonna do somewhere in the last three years. And here you are today and you still have not done it. Or you started, but then you punched out because it got a little awkward you got distracted or whatever. And there's the realization that had I just started then when I said I would, I might be done by now. But because I didn't, here I am two years, three years later, and I'm no further ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well, everybody open their eyes. I'm like, now you tell me what was the faster path not being disciplined because you feel like it's going to take too long or being disciplined to condense the total time it's going to take you. Cause I can't change the steps and I can't change the work. The only way to shorten the amount of time it takes me is by being more disciplined in my use of that time. Mm -hmm. But because people will spend, you know, they'll spend, you take a relationship again, just trying to find good practical examples of this. People will spend, um, People will spend two months talking about somebody, complaining about somebody while the relationship sort of spins and spirals into a dysfunctional place. Um, and then they'll avoid the conversation for another month. Now they're three months into this, you know, mental and emotional relational turmoil, right. so to speak. Um, and then when they finally do have a conversation, it's so pent up, they have a conversation poorly, Meaning that now all of a sudden, like it deepens the, the dysfunction. Next thing you know, it's now six months of this relationship being in a rough spot where had you just gone back to the first week, been really disciplined about aggressive humility, mm -hmm. sharing your. I love half the stuff about you. Unbelievably love it. Right. These are the things that are kind of causing me issues. Yeah. You could have solved it in a week. Yeah. Right. It's pretty it's pretty crazy when you think of it like that. That's uh that's I like that that kind of spin on it of it yeah. is it is the shortcut, you know, if you really think of it in those terms for sure. And and so here and so here's the sort of the last kind of the last sort of I'll, I'll give you kind of two hook points because I, I I find people ask about okay, what do you mean by shortcut? Right. And it's kind of a word like somebody like there are no shortcuts. I'm like, well. If there's a longer way and a shorter way, yes, there is. Um, yeah. And there are longer and shorter ways, right? You know, I'm, I'm working on, you know, I'm working on becoming a scratch golfer and I'm at like a 10-4 right now. And so, you know, discipline is a shortcut. You know, watch how most people practice golf. They don't practice golf in a way that is going to actually bring them closer to being the golfer that they want to be because they practice really poorly with lack of discipline and they play with lack of discipline. And so their golf journey is this really long where they're 15 years in and they're kind of the same golfer they were just with a little bit more touch or whatever, but I'll, I'll give you the, give you the, 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 the two hook points that mentally and emotionally people have to navigate. And I think this is our fundamental challenge in life. And it's probably at the root of, you know, of everything that you're, you're pushing forward to the forefront of people's minds with this podcast is this discipline is the shortcut asks us to hold two things simultaneously. And that is, it asks us to hold urgency and patience at the same time. And the time frame is really where we need to get this. Urgency is in every 24 hours. Every 24 hours is best lived urgently, right? Not anxiously, urgently living out our belief systems, our standards in pursuit of our mission, but only in that 24 hours of capacity. Patience exists over 24 months. And that is allowing 24 months of urgent days to contribute to what can be done in, right? Whatever 365 times two is probably a number I should know, right? In 24 months. So I call discipline is the shortcut for me. The framework is what I call the 24 by 24 strategy. 24 hours of urgent focus matched with 24 months of patient vision and not treating them like a teeter-totter. Meaning what? What happens in people's minds? When their urgency goes up, Brian, what direction does their patience go? Yeah, down. There's this down. belief that to yeah. turn urgency up, I got to turn patience down, okay? 
And then what about the alternative where people say, oh, I'm going to be really patient and they turn their patience up. What directions their urgency go? Yeah. Yeah. And so rather than view it as 50, 50, bring a hundred, hundred strategy. It's a hundred percent urgency and 100% patience. They're different buckets. Hmm. Patience isn't being passive. Getting started isn't putting in a little bit of work and expecting a lot of reward. Urgency is I can only do urgent work today. I can only do a great workout today. And if a great workout today looks like a 15 minute walk around my neighborhood, urgently attack that. And I can't do, right? We're recording this in May, right? I can't do June's work in May. I can't do September's work. I can't do next May's work now. All I can do is today's work right here. And that's the urgent side. And then I believe this, if I just allow that to add up over the next 24 months, which I'm going to be here because there's only one scenario, there's two scenarios. One, I'll be here in 24 months. So I'll get there at the same pace as everybody else. Or two, I won't be here in 24 months. But if I'm going to be here, I don't, that time won't go by any faster. Yeah. So I might as well use this urgent day knowing that the future day will arrive no matter what I do. Yeah. I can't get there any quicker. But what I can do is change the urgency with which I live those days so that when I arrive at that day, my product, right, is better than maybe the next person who didn't put that urgency into their days. Not because I'm always competing against that person, but I just don't want to reach somewhere later in life and then be like, oh, dang. I had all those days. I just didn't use them well. Yeah. Which is what it's just that's that's the part that people get to look. Everybody's had that experience. I've had it. You've had it. Where you're like, oh dang, like had I just done it then, I wouldn't be yeah. feeling like this now. And that's that's for me. That's discipline is the shortcut. It's not anything extravagant. It's just that day's focus, that day's purpose, that day's work, that day's standards. That's the only thing we have to win is today. We'll be wherever we are in two years based on how we manage that. That's a great, uh, let's put a pin in that for now. Maybe have you come on for a part two here down the road. Um, I, I really appreciate it. This is a, a great conversation. Where can everyone find you online? They want to say hello. Any, any shout out to a spot? Yeah. So, so, um, uh, two places, um, obviously you can find me on, on social, um, anywhere at T Brian kite. Uh, my first name is Timothy. So I had parents who named me one thing, called me another. So the T Brian kite is, you can find me on social, and then uh, I write an email uh, every morning called Daily Discipline. It comes at 6 a.m. Eastern time. It's free Monday through Friday. You can get that. And then my, uh, my main website, that's at dailydiscipline.com. Easy to sign up for. And then, uh, and then my main website is tbriancite.com. Awesome, Brian. Thanks so much for joining me. This was a lot of fun and uh, look forward to keeping in touch. Yeah, same here.